Awesome to welcome author, podcast host, speaker, and leadership consultant, Jamie Beckler, to the Basketball Podcast. Jamie Beckler combines his unique experiences as a championship athletic director and college basketball coach and executive business trainer to help take you and your team's results and leadership to the next level. Jamie spent 20 years in organized athletics as a college basketball coach and athletic administrator. He now leads leaders and as a coach to coaches as a team consultant and leadership trainer. He is the host of the popular Success is a Choice podcast and is the author of six ebooks and four published books, including The Bus Trip and The Captain. His on demand program, theleadershipplaybook.com, helps athletes understand how to be better teammates and more positive leaders so their team can have a stronger culture. You can learn more about him at jamiebeckler.com. Jamie, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, I appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for having me. You have interviewed so many successful people and across various industries. And that's one thing I love about your background is you've been exposed, obviously, professional and college sports leaders, educators, entertainers, millionaire business people, and thought leaders in so many different areas. So I'm just curious, what are some common themes that have stood out to you that can help coaches be the best version of themselves too? Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate that. Yeah. We've been very fortunate. We've we've had, you know, poker players, pussycat dolls, pastors, you know, business people, sports people. And obviously you can't say paint with a broad bro- or you can't say specifically that every single person, if they follow these rules or if they do this, it'll lead to success or it'll lead to millions or it'll lead to wins, that kind of stuff. But but there's a couple of things I think of when you ask that question that I think almost everybody is they learn from others. They they learn, they kind of realize that life's too short to make all their mistakes, all the mistakes themselves. And so they they learn from other people. Now, a lot of them have have made mistakes and that's how they've gotten to be successful. They failed forward or they've learned from their mistakes. But a lot of them have also learned by by kind of looking around and seeing what other people are doing. And hey, I'm learning from that person. I'm learning from this person. But with that overall, they're always learning. Leaders are always learning. You're you never have arrived. But with that, the failing forward concept, you know, you you listen to almost every person that I've interviewed and they have some kind of a failure story, some kind of an obstacle story or something, a challenge they had to overcome, whatever that is. And and I think that's a big thing is is understanding that we're all going to fail. You know, we we're not we're not working at a business that's in heaven. We're not coaching a team that's in heaven. You know, it's, it, we're not dealing with a paradise, a perfect situation. We're going to deal with people that are fallible. We're going to deal with situations that always, that don't always go the way we want them to go. And we're not always going to be at the best or the top of our game. And so there's failures, there's things to overcome. And that's what probably is the number one thing I see throughout everybody I've interviewed is that I had some kind of a challenge or a failure, or I wasn't born on third base, you know, so I had to hit a triple or I had to hit a single and then steal second base and then steal third base, metaphorically speaking. But the failing forward thing I think is, is a big deal in understanding that we're always going to fail in some way. What do we do with that? You know, and I think of, I know there's a lot of coaches watching this and, and many of them can relate to, you know, I was, I was the youngest head coach in the country, NCAA, head coach at the age of 27 years ago. Now coaches, I think, are are getting younger and younger. But at the time, 27 was the youngest women's NCAA head coach. Well, four years later, they allowed me to take my talents elsewhere. I got fired. I got resigned. Well, I'm like everybody else. I'm ticked off. It's not my fault. They didn't give me the resources. In fact, I mean, two years earlier, I was coach of the year. I mean, what what's up? I'm coach of the year. And then two years later, they 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 tell me to hit the road. So I'm mad. Well, and I call up a guy named Ed Schilling. Ed Schilling uh, was a former head coach at Wright State. He's now at Grand Canyon, but he's been at Memphis, been in Indiana. Anyways, he was the only coach that I knew that had been fired. And so I called him up immediately. I said, what do I need to do? I'm thinking about, you know, fire legal issues. What do I do with contract? All this. He's like, Jamie, the very first thing you have to do is decide, do I want to be bitter or better? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, you are going to be better or worse five years from now in whatever profession you're in based upon your decision right now. Your actions don't necessarily change right this minute. Your future doesn't change, 
But your first step has to be, am I bitter or better? You're going through a failure. You've been told you're a failure. You, you have an obstacle. You have this challenge to overcome that's huge. Are you going to be bitter or better? Are you going to learn from this and become better? Or are you going to look for excuses or say, hey, they didn't give me the resources. They didn't do X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, I hate you. That's that's so perfect. Like, I don't want to do, I don't want to be better. I want to be bitter. I want to be mad. I want to lash out because it's my ego talking. That was some of the best advice I had ever been given because we don't always handle failure well. You know, and so that was a failure career wise, but we deal with failures or obstacles all the time. How are we going? Are we looking at those as opportunities to get better? I love that. Such a great uh, story. And, uh, you know, those two thoughtful things are uh, obviously so relevant to coaches and and leaders in all businesses. And, uh, you know, one theme that stands out to me kind of, and I'd love to hear your perspective, not just from sports, but from these other arenas as well, is this concept of coachability, which seems central to your work. Can you elaborate on what it means to be coachable and how coaches can foster this trait in their athletes? Yeah, you know, we're we're going to receive criticism. We're going to receive feedback, negative feedback sometimes. We're going to we're going to receive input or suggestions that we don't like. You know, we hate it when we get a suggestion. You know, as coaches, we don't need a fan to give me a suggestion. I don't even need my wife to give me a suggestion. I know I know what we should be doing. We're all going to receive this. And how do we deal with this? How do we process this? How do we respond to the input, the criticism, the, the even the, the innocent suggestions? Most of us tend to be like, I got this, or I know what I'm doing, or, you know, I'm the expert here or whatever it is. I think that the people that are the most coachable, the people that are going to learn the most, people that are going to put themselves in position to be successful are the ones that take all of this from all sources and say, is there anything I can learn from this? Is there anything, maybe right now I can't change this or I can't really give it the, the, the evaluation or the, the, you know, put a really eye to this and, and examine it, but maybe I'm going to do it in the off season. But most of us who discard stuff, we're going to fall short of our potential sometimes. I, I think that's important because we should always be going through life with a growth mindset. Now, as coaches, we're not very good at this. We're very good at telling our kids they should be coachable. We're not very good at growing, learning, developing, and being coachable ourselves. I think the best coaches are the ones that say, you know what, we fell short in this game, let's say. Most of us are like, well, Chris turned the ball over. Chris, Chris shot three for 20. He's got to get back in the gym or the referee screwed us or there's some external factor. And that might have been a big factor in why we lost that game. But our very first thing should be, hey, did I did I coach up Chris? Did I put Chris in the right situations? Yeah, he went three of 20, but maybe I called the wrong plays for him. Or maybe I had the wrong person setting a screen for him. Maybe I'm not even running the right plays for him. Or maybe he was tired and I asked him to take a shot or someone else was guarding him. All these little things add up. And then all of a sudden, it's not just as simple as Chris went three for 20 or Chris turned the ball over at the end. Well, maybe Chris isn't very good with the left hand. And I can say, well, well, then he he should be better at the left hand. Well, maybe I didn't put him in a position. Maybe I had him coming off of a ball screen where he's dribbling with the left hand. Okay. Is it my fault that he can't dribble with his left hand? Is it my fault he turned the ball over? No, but it is my responsibility. And I think as leaders, as coaches, a lot of times we play this blame game. And, and that comes into the coachability part. We don't take it upon ourselves to say, it's my responsibility. No, it is my responsibility. It might not be my fault, but it is 100% my responsibility to find ways to find solutions, to move us forward, to find ways to coach people up. And sometimes as coaches, and I know I was big time guilty of this, especially in my first job, which is why they allowed me to take my, my so-called talents elsewhere, was... I was very not coachable. I didn't, it was always the player's fault. It wasn't my fault. And, and you know what? In most cases I was right, but it is my responsibility to find ways to help my players be better, to find ways to inspire them. So they want to be better, to put them in the right positions, to coach them up where I set them up for success rather than set them up for failure. And so coachability sometimes as, as coaches, we don't do a very good job of this. And then why would we expect our players to be very coachable if we're not? like that. The the last thing I would say about this in, in terms of players, they won't admit that they're not coachable. Sometimes we can approach them or or come at it with the mindset of, hey, Chris, you know, 
I know that you want to get better. I know that you're coachable, but you're not very approachable right now. You're not showing that you're coachable. I, I, I have a hard time coming to you or, or my assistant, you know, coach so-and-so said that they didn't want to say something to you because you didn't look like you wanted to take instruction right then. But I know you're coachable and I know you want to get better. And sometimes if you, if you come at it with that mindset, sometimes it softens just a little bit that, that kids, you know, some, some kids don't look very good. Now you and I both know it's because they're not coachable. They really don't want to hear the bad stuff, but if you come at it with just a little bit, a softer approach to it in terms of you're not being very approachable right now. I think sometimes that kind of stuff can help a kid be a little bit more coachable and it can be teaching them, you know, you can get through to them a little bit better sometimes, but it does start with us. Well, I really like that connection between coachability and approachability, because I think often, even as coaches, when we turn it back on ourselves, like you did in terms of talking about us being coachable, when we talk about players, is it a question of them being not coachable or is it a question of our approach in approaching that player? Because certain players need different approaches to be more coachable. <laughs> that's that's actually great. I'm 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 going to steal that. I'm going to start using that too because on our end, yeah. How are we approaching them? And then you know if if we put them on the defensive, you know w w what's our timing like? You know we just I pull Chris out of the game because he just screwed up. Okay, we've all done this as a coach or or a leader just in general. We're going to right now, we're going to nip this in the bud or I'm going to I'm going to tell you what you need to do better next time. Well, rarely am I pulling Chris out of the game to put him back in the game after 3 seconds. You know, I I'm going to put him back in in like a minute or 2 minutes. Well, let him go get a drink, let him cool down for 60 seconds and then I can approach him. We, we oftentimes don't communicate with Chris at the right time. You know, we, we have to do it right now. I have to tell you exactly what I need to tell you right now. And then you get all defensive and then we, it escalates. And now we have an issue on our hands. And now I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, Chris isn't coachable. Well, no, maybe I didn't approach him the right way. So I love that, Chris. So you, you also brought up this concept of obviously a lot of information coming towards coaches and, and certainly in this modern era, there's probably too much information. So is there any advice to coaches in terms of filtering the information, whether it's from players, you mentioned parents, you mentioned different types of people with suggestions. I mean, all this stuff or stuff. Is there any types of uh, informa or information filtering systems that you can advise us on? I don't have a great, like if you do these three things, you'll be able to filter it all the time. It's, it's just a practice of getting in the habit of being discerning, of, of being wise. I think we can learn from everybody. You know, and, and that's a reason schools bring in some ex-convict who's been in prison for 20 years. I mean, he he appears like, well, he's an idiot. You know, he's made terrible choices his whole life. Well, can we learn from that person and their story? I think we can learn from everybody, even the the Yahoo parent that comes up to us and is like, you know, well, back in 83, I won a championship. You see my ring? You know, I can do this. You know, you should be doing this. And it's like, well, 83 is a lot different than now. But maybe there's one thing or two things you can still learn from him. If nothing else, you can get inside his head and know where he's coming from or where that parent's coming from. So I think we can always discern things. That doesn't mean we have to take their advice, take their suggestion. Sometimes maybe we can ask some, some clarifying questions as well. You know, the, you know, Chris, Chris gives me a suggestion. Maybe I can ask two or three clarifying questions to kind of get at the heart of why he's even mentioning this to me or, well, how might this work in our situation? I know this worked in 83, but, but instead of saying, well, no, that won't work. Cause that was 1983 say, okay, well, you know, well now we have a shot clock or now we have X, Y, or Z. How would this work now? And, and obviously it's going to be situationally dependent. You know, I can't go over everything that a, every suggestion someone could give me, but, you know, just kind of being curious, I guess. You know, I, I said at the start, learning, learning is very important for leaders. We should always be in continually a continuous state of learning. We should be very curious as well. Hey, why are you saying this? Why is this suggestion coming when it is? You know, hey, maybe I don't take, you know, I just got off of a webinar, hosting a webinar. And one of the things I said in the webinar was I might say something that you can't use in your current situation, but it might trigger or it might percolate, get your mind percolating about, it leads to another idea that you can use in your situation. So maybe something someone says, you're not gonna use that exactly, but it gets your mind spinning about, about something else. But we should always be continual learners. 
And, and just because we think we've learned, we haven't arrived. You know, you go to a tailor, maybe you get a, a fancy suit. That tailor is going to measure you up. Well, you go back to that tailor six months from now. Hopefully when I walk through that door, that tailor doesn't say to me, Hey, Jamie, Mr. Beckler, you know, welcome back. Here's a suit for you. Well, I could have gone to any department store and got a suit off the rack. A good tailor is going to measure me up again because maybe I've changed in six in six months. Well, the people we interact with or the game itself might change. And so we have to constantly and continually learn new things, be adaptable, adjust to things. So that's the same way with people giving us suggestions. We have to constantly learn from people and, and see where other people are coming from. Can, can I adapt that to our current situation? Do I need, you know, just because it worked in the past doesn't mean it's going to work moving forward. So I didn't necessarily give you a great answer in terms of you follow these steps and you'll be able to discern better, but it's just a constant habit where you're constantly on the lookout for how can I get better? And that's where a lot of us fall short is we're not continually looking how we can get better. We're just continually getting in a rut or doing a routine or what we've always done, hoping we get the same result. Well, both of us run online businesses, so we know that steps <laughs> don't solve all problems. Even though we can always put out the list of the seven things that will do this, this, and this, but I'm not a step guy either. So uh, there are, there just aren't perfect steps anyways, but I love that answer. And I, I think another thing, just kind of from your experience, and I know it's really, really in the news right now about coaching in general is about balancing our personal well being, our mental health, you know, with the pursuit of excellence, with competing with these different things. So can you talk a little bit about your perspective on that? Yeah. You know, it's really tough. And and I've had some people on that are good with mental toughness, mental training, mental health. And I know those aren't all the same, but they're really good with mental stuff. Like they've been trained, they've gotten degrees in psychology, things like that. A lot smarter people than me. Almost always I ask them, how do we balance those coaches or how do the coaches listen to this balance mental health with mental toughness? Because all of us as coaches, we want our athletes to be mentally tough. We want people to be mentally tough. Now, I do think that that's, we walk a fine line sometimes, and I'm not the mental expert. There's a lot of people, lots of people smarter than me about that out there. But one thing I'll say is that oftentimes I think as coaches, we think of mental toughness as the Navy SEALs approach or the perfect approach where, where nothing phases us or we're able to accomplish anything. It's almost like we have this bionic brain, you know, this, this brain that's a superpower. Oftentimes, though, I think mental toughness is really just the ability to recognize that there's something, recognize there's a challenge, recognize that maybe there's a better way, recognize and be self-aware and then be able to be resilient, be able to bounce back or be able to take another course of action. It's not always about controlling our thoughts, our initial thoughts, but maybe controlling our second thought. You know, it's, it's hey, this, this thought just entered my brain, but then I recognize it and then take a different course of action that's better. I respond to that better. It's not that you're happy when a referee makes a call, a bad call. It's that you respond negatively to it less than you used to. You're able to bounce back. You're able to, to as Coach K talks about, next play. It's not that you don't have this initial response. It's that you're able to respond to that response quicker. And that takes practice. You know, what I'm able to do, you know, as a 21-year-old might be different than I did as a 17-year-old. Or what I do as a 50-year-old might be different than as a 21-year-old. I might have more practice, more experience. And so it's about being resilient, bouncing back maybe quicker. So our response time, did I, you know, Chris as my athlete, it's not that Chris is going to respond perfectly. It's that Chris's response time to take the right course of action is going to get better and better each day or each week or each month or each year. You know, hopefully we see progress there. And so I, I know, I know it's not the same mental illness, mental health, mental toughness, but I think sometimes we talk about mental toughness as a catch-all or as this perfect way to respond, I don't think it's always that perfect way to respond. It's about, can we handle this distraction, this obstacle over here and be able to redirect our focus to what our goal should be? Uh, I and, and I'll get to the mental health in just a minute, but the mental toughness part, I had the luxury or the fortune uh, a few years ago of working with the Toronto Raptors in the off season. I know you as a former Canadian, I, I imagine you were a Raptors fan being up in that area yeah. uh, in, in Ontario, but 
you know, for a couple weeks, it was the off season. It, they were having their mini camp out in LA. And a lot of the teams have their mini camps in LA because a lot of players live in LA during the off season. So during this mini camp, it's really just the coaches and the players. And then I'm, I had the fortune of being with them as well. And, and so we pull up to this, this community college gym to, to have a workout and we pile out. There's about six athletes in this one van along with a couple coaches and myself. And there's these, these two bags of balls, towels, water bottles where the players are going to have to carry them in. Well, you can see, and it seems like forever, but it's only a few seconds, but you can see these six, seven professional basketball players huddled around two bags and they're doing the mental math. And they're like, well, if I just hold off long enough, the numbers say I don't have to carry something. It seemed like forever. But then all of a sudden, Fred Van Vliet, Fred Van Vliet comes in the middle, picks up both bags, says, screw this. Let's go get better. And he walks towards the gym and all the other athletes follow in suit. Well, that wasn't the time to compare bank accounts, to compare or to be like, well, I'm an NBA all-star, all, a pro. I don't have to carry a bag. I'm, I'm above this. Fred Van Fleet, essentially, in his actions and even voicing, you know, screw this, let's go get better, reminded them, we are here to get better. We're here to win a world championship. We're not here for a media thing to compare anything, resumes. That's not how you win a world championship by comparing resumes or worrying about any of that stuff. We're, we win a world championship by going in this gym where there's no cameras, nobody around to get better, you know, the unseen hours. And he reminded of them, reminded them of that. When it comes to mental toughness, it's not that those guys just stood around and were mentally weak or mentally soft, but it's how quickly after that initial, well, I don't want to carry a bag, do they snap out of it and realize, you know what? We're not here for that. We're here to get better. And sometimes it takes one person like a Fred Van Vliet to remind them of that kind of stuff. Sometimes it takes, Chris is really mentally tough, but maybe he's having a tough day. It takes somebody else to remind him of something. It's not the initial thing. It's that that response sometimes. It, it's, it's being, it's focusing on our goal. You know, distractions are what we see when we take our eyes off the goal. The more mentally tough you are, the more you're able to bounce back to what is our purpose? What's our goal here? When it gets into the mental health issue, I think coaches have to remember that not every kid is going to be, quote unquote, as mentally tough as we want them to be. Sometimes, you know what? They're really going through illnesses. They're going through their health isn't as strong as it needs to be mentally. Just like some of us might be great physical specimens. I wouldn't point at myself as an example of that, but some of us are. Even the people that are strong physically are going to catch colds. They're going to get the flu. They're going to be worn down at times. So sometimes mental health, the mental illness part of that, we as coaches have to recognize that, you know what? Our kids are human. They're not going to be perfect all the time. Just like they're not going to be perfect physically, they're not going to be perfect mentally. And so we need to understand that. And so maybe we need to call in an expert or have people on staff or have resources available for those people. Love that Raptor story, of course. That's tremendous and connecting so many things with that story. And the Coach's Bulletin Board, one of the first books I read of yours, you talked a lot about intentional communication. So I just want you to bring that home to people. Because again, coaches throw out communication. We got to communicate, we got to <laughs> communicate. But what is actually intentional communication? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, we forget that communication is two ways. It's not just us as the expert, you know, and that's what a lot of us as coaches do. I am going to tell you what to do and then you do it. Well, sometimes we're not very clear. And I'm like, well, how more clear can I be? Or I've told you a million times. It's not about it's clear to us. It's clear to them. And oftentimes we need to be a little bit more clear. And just because like a basketball team, it might be clear to my two smartest people or my two captains doesn't mean it's clear to the 13th, 14th, 15th man. Or it's also not clear to them after they've run five line drills or five sprints. Maybe they're dead tired or maybe the referee just made a bad call on them or they have an ego issue. There's a lot of barriers or obstacles that get in the way of communication. And so we have to intentionally be better with our communication and understand that every person maybe is a little bit different in how they handle that communication. Communication only takes place if our message is interpreted the way it needed to be interpreted by the person that it was intended for. You know, if I communicate to you, Chris, 
you might not interpret it the way I intended it to be interpreted. And if so, healthy communication didn't take place. And so we have to intentionally and purposefully communicate certain ways to certain people so that it gets across to those people. Everyone's going to hear things differently. They're going to understand things differently. But yeah, as coaches, even as, you know, your wife, my wife probably hears things differently than we hear things or they hear things differently than we said it. You know, there's communication issues in every relationship. Coaching is no different. Being a leader is no different. We have to communicate the way they need us to communicate and in a timely manner, in the right manner for everybody. And so, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's very important, you know, in the way that we communicate. I loved what you said earlier about the way we approach somebody. The way we communicate with somebody might be different than it needs to be with somebody else. Somebody might be able to get dog cussed out. You know, we, we might be able to be really aggressive with somebody or, or hard, coach them hard. Well, somebody else, we can't, we can't take that same template. You know, we can't take that same approach with somebody else. And so we need to be very intentional. I, I would say, sit down with your assistants, sit down with the people around you, or if it's just you, write down on paper, hey, this is how every one of my players this is how I should communicate with them, or this is what motivates them the best or inspires them the best. And then just like that Taylor example, revisit that every once in a while. All right. Did, are they having issues? What do they, are they, are, are we able to communicate? Am I able to communicate with Chris the same way when things are going well as when things aren't going well? Now it'd be great if I can communicate with Chris the same way, no matter the situation, but maybe he handles things differently based upon the situation. I need to know that as well. That has more to do with your success as a team than the X's and O's and the plays you run a lot of times is how are you able to inspire them? And inspiring oftentimes comes back to the communication part. Am I communicating in the right way to inspire those athletes? And then nowadays, different ways to communicate, obviously texting and, and phone calls and emails and all these different things. And do, do, do visual reinforcements play a key part in this modern way of communicating? Well, they certainly can. It goes back to we've never had more resources, more tools at our disposal. You know, and a lot of people like to say, well, kids nowadays or social media is killing these kids or or whatever. And it's like almost anything else in the history of mankind. It can be good or bad how we use utilize it. I think social media can be amazing. Um, the visuals can be amazing if we utilize them in the right way. Uh, a lot of us don't adapt and adjust to the times. You know, back back in the day, if you, if you had asked someone in the 1900s, you know, what improvements they wanted in transportation, they'd probably say like a faster horse. You know, they wouldn't have said a car. You know, people sometimes are are slow to adjust to different things that go on. We as coaches need to adjust, adapt, uh, so we don't fall behind, but also so that we can have the most maximum impact on our kids and and lead to eventually the most potential for success on our teams. And so we don't do that a lot of times, but let's say Chris loves this visual stuff, or I figured Chris out. That doesn't mean I figured out the other 14 athletes on our team or student athletes on our team. So I need to figure out, all right, just because Chris likes it one way, doesn't mean that that's the only way we do it. How many times, and I know this isn't necessarily visual or current, current social media, but how many times do we run them at the end of practice? whatever sport it is, we run for some conditioning at the end of practice, you know, they're bent over, they're huffing and puffing, maybe they're puking, whatever, you know, they're, they're, they're terrible. They're hating it. We huddle them up then, you know, very few of them are even paying attention to us, but then we give them four or five instructions or four and five announcements at the end. And then we get mad the next day because they didn't turn their paperwork in on time or they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Well, I told you yesterday, well, you told them, at an inopportune time. You told them when they weren't paying attention, when they were dead tired. Maybe you could have put up, maybe you could have said that at that time, but maybe put up the on the announcements in the locker room, put up those four or five announcements. Maybe you could have sent that out in an email as well or a text message or on social media. There's different ways you can do it so that you set your people up for success. And, and it doesn't mean you're enabling them. Enabling them would be maybe you're doing everything for them all the time. I don't think reminding people is always enabling them. Some people just need more reminders. Now, if we live in the world of should, yeah, should Chris remember? Should Chris pay attention? Yes. But the reality is the teenagers we deal with or even the young adults we deal with or even at the professional level, it doesn't matter. 
human nature is human nature and they're not paying attention. Their attention span is short. You know, even you think about what they love. They love Instagram and TikTok. Well, even Instagram and TikTok, they're only watching a video for like seven seconds, 20 seconds. Even the things that they love the most, they're not paying to paying attention to very long. And so we have to figure out how can I set our, our athletes up for success? A lot of times it's various modes of communication. And you're not just talking about athletes. I mean, you're talking about parents and I'll tell you <laughs> as a parent of two daughters playing AU and balancing every, everything else that's going on in their lives and our lives, we appreciate over communication, not, not uh, just go check the app or go figure it out on your own. We appreciate the over communication and we never feel it's invasive. And I think that most parents certainly feel that way. And most players, you know, feel that way as well, because they just need to know what's going on because we are busier as humans because there's more things bombarding us. So I love those examples. And another part of your communication plan, which I know you're big on is the captain and talking about leadership, internal leadership, whether you call it a captain or internal leadership, whatever it is. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about is this concept of a captain effectively balancing, navigating between authority and empathy, because that's the challenge, right? I have to be an authority and support the coach, but at the same time, I'm a teammate who has to show some empathy for some of the things they're going through. And that's got to be one of the biggest challenges, isn't it? Yeah. And when you're talking about that, you know, we talk about captains as a catch-all. I like to think of it as positional leadership. So, so you might have in basketball, five starters. Well, they're all all, they all have leaders of position, positions of leadership in a way, or maybe you have some seniors that aren't technically captains, but they have positions of leadership because of their status, their age. And so anytime you have kind of a position of leadership, there's that, that fine line to walk because you don't want them to be looked upon as a snitch or coach's boy or coach's girl, but you also don't want them to just be like any other player and they don't help the team out by talking to the coach about stuff. It starts with the coach. The coach has to help educate that player about in their program, what is good and what's bad, how you can be a liaison. All right. These, and, and, and I can't talk to specifics because it's going to be different for every program and what your preference is as a coach, but you should be able to say, Hey, these are some things that you can handle on your own. These are some things that in the locker room you should be able to deal with. And we're going to help you. We're going to help train you on how to deal with these things. When a player does this or, a, or your friend does this or a teammate does this, this is what, you know, would be helpful for how you can manage that situation. And so we're going to help train you and educate you on those things. All right. These are the five or six things that, you know what, probably are above your pay grade. You know, probably you're not going to be able to handle as well. And you need to come to an assistant coach. Talk to an assistant coach about these things. These would be the five or six things. All right, these are the, this is the one or two or three things that are deal breakers. These are the things you have to come and talk to me about as the head coach. You don't want them to come and talk to you about everything maybe. But these are the two or three things you absolutely are going to need to bypass. You can't do it on your own. You got to bypass the assistant. You need to come right to me. And th that's going to vary about you, in every program and you as a coach, your personality, what you, what you want, but, but expel that out and really train your captains, educate them. But that's where we fall short as coaches is we don't educate our captains. We expect them to know how to be a captain because, well, you don't steal from Walmart. You get A's in the class and you're a starter. So you know how to be a captain. No, no, these kids don't know how to be captains. They don't know how to hold their teammates accountable. They don't know how to talk to their teammates or their friends when things are tough. We need to help them with that. And then if they fail, which they will fail because they're teenagers or they're young adults, they will fail. Well, then how to fail forward, how to learn from that, not, not to be a, I got you coach. Oh, I got you. You know, you, you did what I told you you were going to screw up or, you know, or, or your expectations are so high when they fail you're like, I, I, you just think badly about them or you think differently about them because they messed up. They're not an extension of you. They're not you. You're more mature. You have more experience. Don't put the weight of expectations on their shoulders so much that if they fail, well, it's like they're an assistant coach failing. No, they're a kid. They're a player. They're going to, they're still learning how to be a leader. They're still learning how to be that captain. Help them through that. Set them up for success but educate them, train them on that stuff. Maybe put things in a different perspective. So instead of, hey, you've got to be the policeman. You've got to be, hold your teammates accountable. You got to, you got to come down on your, you know, you got to, you got to come down on your teammates when they're not doing what they're supposed to do. 
maybe talk about, hey, you need to remind your teammates, remind your friends of what they've said as their goals. Remind your friends, remind your teammates of the standards. Remind them of this is how we do things here or this is not how we do things here. Maybe put it in the framework of reminding rather than just coming down on them or being that policeman in the locker room. So two things stand out for me from what you said. But the number one thing is that you said like captains not knowing how to say or how to handle or all this stuff. Look, after being like immersed in the youth world over the last two years, especially, I can tell you coaches are just assuming way too much that players know these things. They know how to be a teammate. They know how to talk to someone. They know how to advocate for themselves. And, and certainly it's some of the parents' responsibilities, but I just think coaches don't understand. Like they blame the player or this generation, but they don't realize that nobody's taught them. And maybe we used to teach it more in the past, Jamie. I don't know. But I've got to think that just anything that a player doesn't understand, it's because nobody's taught them how to do it. And you started this whole conversation with that, which is look back in the mirror. Yeah. And, and, and not just teach them, but keep teaching them and keep teaching them and keep teaching them because they're young. I mean, I've told you this a million times. Well, maybe you got to tell them a million and one times, you know, or maybe you got to tell them in a different way or, or present it in a different way. I, I believe as coaches, I said this at the start or, or near the start of this interview, it, it might not be our fault, but it is our responsibility. If the parents are idiots or if kids nowadays, okay, so what? It's still your responsibility to find a solution. It's not just throw up our hands and complain about today's generation or whatever. John Wooden had every right to say, well, today's kids, you know, they're wearing the long hippie hair and they're protesting the Vietnam war. I, that was a pretty tough era to be a coach in and he managed to do it. Other coaches managed to do it. Every coaching generation has obstacles and challenges they're different than the time people before them. You just have to adapt. You have to adjust. You have to figure out how I can inspire people. You have to figure out how I can get the most out of them. You can't rest on your laurels. You can't rest on, well, this has always worked in the past. Kids now are a little bit different. That doesn't mean that they're bad. It doesn't mean that they can't learn. It just means maybe they haven't been taught certain things. If you're a high school coach, if you're a youth coach and think that the oldest kid on your team is going to be a good leader just because they're the oldest kid or because they go to church or because they come from a good family or because X, Y, or Z, then you're missing the boat because they are they don't know how to handle stuff. As adults, we don't know how to handle stuff. You turn on TV or scroll through social media and you realize really quickly as adults, we should know better and we don't handle adversity very well. We don't handle bad communication very well. When we disagree with someone, we don't handle that very well. So how are kids going to do that? And then at the college level, how many times do we get a kid and we're like, well, you know, they, they were captains in high school, so they know how to be a captain here. Well, then it goes back to, well, how do, were we training them to be captains and at the youth level, at the high school level? So we have to educate them on stuff. We have to educate them on how to be a good teammate, what that means. I mean, Think about this. How many kids do we have at the end of the bench that we assume are going to be good teammates just because they're good kids? There are a lot of good kids that are terrible teammates because they have egos and they don't like sitting on the bench. It doesn't make them a bad kid. It makes them human. Nobody likes to sit on the bench while everybody else is out there having fun or getting the glory. We have to, number one, teach it, but then we have to reinforce when they do we have to reward and reinforce those behaviors reward. Hey, if I'm asking you to sacrifice and sit on the bench, man, I'm going to catch you being good when you're a great teammate, when you help a teammate, you know, the kid that's out there, you know, Chris is playing instead of me. Well, when I help Chris see something on the court that maybe he wouldn't have seen otherwise as a coach, I'm going to go to that kid and say, Hey, great job helping out Chris. Great job you know, picking up the towels. Great job helping the trainer. Hey, I saw you were the first one to jump up on the bench and give high fives to the people when they came out of the game. Those kinds of things. If 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 Chris goes and sets a screen, man, I'm going to praise him all day long for doing what he was supposed to do. Not say, well, why should I pat him on the back for doing what he's supposed to do? No, because we all want a pat on the back. When I do the dishes, I want my wife to pat me on the back and say, good job, even though that's what I'm supposed to do. I like that. That's going to encourage me to do more of that. I don't need to congratulate Steph Curry on hitting the shot. That shouldn't be the very first thing when he hits the sh game winning shot at the end of the game. 
man, I should be, I should be praising Clay Thompson for taking that charge with five seconds to go. They even gave us the ball back. Those are the kinds of things that if we as coaches can start praising our kids or catching them being good, then we're going to inspire them to do more of those good things. And we don't do that as coaches enough. I call it normalize and notice, normalize things and notice things. And your your point is beautiful in the sense that, yeah, we don't have to nor notice and normalize the obvious, which is making the shot, right? It's all those other factors that go into it. And we're not just talking about on the court. We're talking about off the court. And I think that's really what you're hitting home for all of us is those moments on the bench. If my daughter sits on a bench for a whole game and doesn't play, then I want to normalize and notice that that's normal, but also notice that she still did her job in terms of being on the bench. But that's one thing for a parent, but I want the coach to be able to acknowledge that. Right. And that's yeah. the thing that I think coaches are missing is that those noticing moments are the ones that keep your team more aligned with your vision, your purpose, and all those different things. It's it's not that you got to say, well, you know, Steph, you know, that was a good shot, but, you know, you've hit a bunch of them before. No big deal. Right. You don't have to de-emphasize or I mean, you don't have to like criticize it or you don't have to like just brush it to the side, but you want to prop everyone else up. You want to pro- if you're if you're talking about the team, the team, the team all the time. And hey, Chris, you got to sacrifice, you know, hey, you're going to run all these sprints every day and be second string and never get into the game. Well, why should you even have a good attitude? Why should you be encouraged? But if I'm now pointing out the good things you did, hey, in the third quarter, you did this, or, hey, guys, we won this game. You guys played awesome. But let me tell you, first of all, before we get into much of this game, I want to tell you, scout team, scout team, what you guys did on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, that had as much to do about what we did tonight as anything else. Guys, great job. Way to bust your tail all three days of practice leading up to this game. That was huge for us, you know, and it doesn't have to be that exact thing. The more you can, I love, I love what you said there about, you know, normalize it or, or just, you know, notice and normalize when you can recognize, when you can catch people being good, when you talk about, you know, instead of Christian McCaffrey, all right, great job. You had two or three touchdowns. Great job. Hey, offensive lineman, way to create a hole, you know, great job. Hey, wide receiver, wide receiver on that run. I saw you that, that, that safety thought you were going deep that whole time. And that took him on the other side of the field, which allowed Christian to go score a touchdown when he got into the the second level of the defense. When you point those little things out, that's huge for your team because now it encourages them. It inspires them to keep doing those little things that actually you and I know go into winning, you know, Steph Curry doesn't hit a shot if there's a poor screen all the time. Now, now he's probably a bad example because he can hit a shot anytime. But most normal people, mere mortals, they can't hit a shot if they're not open. And you don't get open if there's not a good screen. And if the ball is not delivered to you in the right, you know, at the right time. All those things, or the person cutting down the lane, they pass the ball, they cut down the lane, that takes the defense, you know, shifting over. And that might be the difference between someone driving in and getting a charge or a block. You know, those little things, when we start noticing those things and catch people being good, they do more of that. When you go in and talk to sports teams, particularly, let's focus on that. Yep. Are you making it more interactive than you used to in the sense that, you know, used to be, again, a lot of go in, lecture, give them a list type of thing. And I give you an example, Darius Nichols, who was on the podcast episode 295, talked about that a lot of these situations that you and I are talking about right now, they role play within their team. It's not just this one talk. It's this interactivity. Has that changed for you in terms of over the years? Yeah, it certainly has. No, now, obviously, it's going to be based upon how much time I have with the team and how often I'm working with them. You know, if it's if it's just a one time thing and and you're talking to them for thirty or forty five minutes, you have less opportunity to really get in and do some, you know, some activities or have a lot of engagement because there's certain concepts that you want them to get. But yes, when you're working with student athletes, especially, the less it can be me lecturing, the better. Because because I could be the most entertaining person in the world. There's a reason that Netflix specials with com- comedy comedians are only like an hour long anyways. Those are some of the most entertaining people on the face of the earth, and they're still only an hour long. It, it's hard to keep people's attention. Just one-way communication. So you want to have as much engagement as possible. You want to have as much activity as possible. And, and you want to have illustrations, stories coming at it from different angles as well. You know, instead of telling them three different ways to be a better teammate, if you can give them three different examples of being a good teammate, 
or activities. The more you can change it up that way, maybe it hits more people. Go back to that learning, the learning methods as well. But the more ways you can say the same thing, maybe it hits everybody on that team or at least has the likelihood of hitting more people. But yeah, definitely. And, and it's like anything else. You know, I've been doing this for six years now, full time. I'm better now than I was six years ago. Hopefully I'm better, you know, four years from now, five years, six years from now than I am right now. You know, you keep growing just like as a coach. You know, it took me getting fired to be a better coach, to be a more coachable coach. No doubt you will be better in uh, six years. I have no doubt about that. And uh, <laughs> one of the other books I read, The Bus Trip, you know, it, again, maybe let's just before we go into the book, but can you elaborate on how the experiences, kind of this parallel experience and dynamic of a bus trip mirror those of actually being on the sports team? I think that's a pretty cool analogy that you drew. Yeah, we tried to to put out there a book that was fictional and, and certainly a lot of the inspiration was, was gleaned from John Gordon. You know, John Gordon has a great, a lot of great books. I think he's written two since we started interviewing here. He seems like he puts out books all the time, but John Gordon's had some great books and, and they're very simple and they're very practical. And I wanted to, I wanted to write a book similar to that. That was practical, simple, easy to read only in a couple of hours. And a kid could read it and feel like, Oh man, that happened on our bus trip or that happened on our team, or I can totally relate to that. So we wanted to put a book together like that. And so it's a fictional book about a team that's struggling, but the players end up on this one bus trip, this one road trip, they end up figuring out, Hey, we need to be better leaders. We need to be better teammates. And it has nothing to do with the coach. We all can do a little bit different and we need to start doing a little bit better. And so I wanted to put a lot of experiences, both from when I was an athlete when I was a coach and also with the teams I'm working with now, whether it's on a continual basis or one-offs, gleaning those stories, those experiences, what they're going through right now and put them in a book that could help players understand. It, it doesn't matter if you have a good or a bad coach, you can control certain things. And so how can we as a team, how can we as a collection of, of student athletes be better leaders, better teammates, and so that's what we wanted to try to do with the book. And, and so we have a bunch of different stories, a bunch of different situations. But yeah, stopping off at a restaurant, stopping off at a rest area or a truck stop, you know, when you're traveling, conversations that happen in the back of the bus. Because at the end of the day, we all have issues, drama, situational situations, even the good teams have them in your locker room, in the cafeteria, in the dorm room, in the hallways, in the back of the bus that come up. And that stuff can make or break a team as much as any play that a coach will call it's that's the kind of stuff you know we talk about all the time that culture is where your players are not where your coach is your true culture is when your players are gathered together without a coach that's when your true culture comes out cultures where players are not where the coach is and so the back of the bus so this book the bus trip your culture truly is what those players conversations are how they're responding and acting when the coach isn't around. And so we tried to put together something that, that maybe something would click in a, in a player's mind and say, Hey, you know what? I can do X, Y, or Z to be better. So I love it. it it's, it's great. I love that uh, example there, that culture is where your players are. And I think the main thing for coaches maybe now is to connect this and say, all these lessons learned, whether it's the back of the bus or these different moments throughout a season, how can we build these experiences or translate them into sustained growth and to help with performance, to help with success, to help with enjoyment of the season? Yeah. And, and, and first of all, it's got to come back to, do we actually want that? Because this is a lot harder. It is a lot harder. It's a lot harder to do this stuff than it is to watch some of your other podcast episodes or some of your videos or subscribe to, you know, your, your online membership site. You know, Chris, you got a lot of awesome stuff, but it really is a lot easier to take a great zone offense or a great quick hitter or tweak this little thing on defense than it is to actually say, you know what? I want to actually be a culture coach. I want to be somebody that's paying attention to this stuff. I think plays are great. I I loved plays. <laughs> you know, I, I got a lot of great plays back in the day when it was hard, when there weren't sites like yours. But at the end of the day, you can have the greatest play. You know, I'm running... Coach K's plays, Pat Summit's plays, Tom Izzo's plays. But if my players don't trust me or they don't trust each other, maybe they like each other, but they have different agendas. Hey, if I take this shot or if, if, if I set a great screen for Chris, 
Chris gets a shot, well, how am I going to get a college scholarship or how am I going to be all conference? I wanted that shot. It comes down to people issues a lot of times. So the best plays can be blown up or not work if we have people issues on our teams. And so it starts with, hey, do I want to invest the time to actually work on leadership, to work on these soft skills, to work on these character issues, to, to train up our, our captains, to educate all of our people about how they're going to act, how they're going to be a great teammate. That takes a lot of time and effort. And you know what? At the end of the day, like in a marriage, I'm going to guess, Chris, that that it's easier for you to bring home chocolates and flowers than it is to actually say nice things to your wife 24 seven or to compliment her, her or to actually have your actions reflect your words. I know it is a lot harder for me. So as a coach, it's a lot easier to bring home the flowers and chocolates to put in a new play or to change the starting lineup than it is actually every single day when I pass someone in the hallway or when we're getting on the bus or when we're doing X, Y, or Z to actually be a culture coach and to actually pay attention and be self-aware. And so that's, that's hard for us. You know, I've seen some, some division one, division three, high school pro, it doesn't matter the way they interact and, and, and have their relationships with their players outside of that two hour practice, so to speak, oftentimes does more for that team and their success than anything else that they could do. You know, now I've also seen coaches that turn it on and off. And when they get on the court, they're a different player or the different coach. But their players understand that or they see that. And ultimately, it's not sustainable. Now, very rarely. I mean, you'll have a, a unicorn once in a while. But most of the time, how you interact with your players on the bus, how you interact with the players when they can't help you, how you interact with that 15th man on your bench says more to the success of your program ultimately than what play you're running. And so I know sometimes people don't want to hear that because it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder for me to bring home flowers and chocolates to my wife than it is to actually pick up my socks off the floor or do the dishes when I'm supposed to, or not get mad at her when she complains about something. Not that she complains, honey, if you're listening to this. We'll make sure she probably doesn't listen to the basketball podcast yet, but uh, for your episode, she will. That's a great example. Jamie, this has uh, just been tremendous. And uh, I, I'm curious with your expertise, kind of looking towards the future and uh, what but what trends potentially do you see emerging in sports coaching and leadership development? And how do you envision coaches adapting to these changes? Yeah, you know, two things come to mind really quick. And, and one is we have a lot of specialty. And I, I know we've had a lot of specialty coaches in the past or, or, you know, you delegate a lot of responsibilities out. So let's say football. I know at the college level, especially division one level, they have a general manager now. Well, you've never had a general manager before, but that person maybe is, is handling the NIL, NILs or handling certain areas. Or, you know, you look at some of these division one staffs and they have 40 guys on their coaching staff. You know, I think the problem that we can run into sometimes when we go to the specialty areas or we have so many people handling so many things, which I think is a great thing. You know, I, I can never understand in football why you ever have a shot clock or not a shot clock, but a, a play clock issue or, hey, we should have went for two when we should have went for one or timeout situation because you have so many people that should be focused on that one thing. But what we happens with the more delegation we have is we lose responsibility sometimes. We might delegate tasks, but we don't delegate the responsibility of that task. We still have to be responsible for training up all those people, helping them understand what we're looking for, helping give them the education that they need, equipping them. We don't sometimes give them even the resources to do what they need to do. You know, you go to a, an NBA game. Uh, I was at a couple uh, Milwaukee Bucks games or uh, recently, and, and, you know, and, and a lot of teams have this, but they have people that are specifically watching just to figure out do they, do they question a call? You know, do they go to the replay on the call? And that has to be a really quick thing. Are you giving people the proper technology to do their job? Are you helping them understand what you're going to want in certain situations? Are you helping them understand the whole big picture where everything's tied together? So not just delegating these tasks specifically. And I think that's the way we're going is that we're delegating a lot of things and we're having a lot of people do specific tasks. But understanding we can't delegate the responsibility. We still have to be the CEO. We still have to be responsible for helping them do their job the best that they can be and setting them up for success. 
The second thing that I thought of right away, and we already kind of addressed it, but adjusting and adapting to the times. NIL is a big deal. Transfer portal is a big deal. I see a lot of coaches complaining about that. The reality is it's here at least for right now, and it's probably going to be here in some shape or form in the future. You can't cry over spilled milk. You might not like something. You have to adjust to it. You might not like the new free throw rules. You might not like the you know, new whatever rules. You have to adapt and adjust. You might not like that kids are on TikTok all the time. You might not like that X, Y, or Z with, with our parents or administrators or kids. You have to adapt and adjust. And that's one of the things I think moving forward, there's a lot of different rule changes. There's a lot of just the culture and environment of sports is changing in a lot of ways. And, and especially at the higher level, NIL, transfer portal, but even at the pro level, and I know, you know, not as many pro coaches are watching this as as college or high school or youth coaches, but still at the pro level, you see coaches with winning records get fired. Coaches with winning records are struggling. Even at that level, you still have to adapt and adjust to the the landscape, the environment of your sport. And, and the coaches that are going to be the most successful are the ones that can adapt and adjust, you know, not necessarily be stuck in their old ways. And I'm not saying be like a tumbleweed, you know, whichever way the wind blows, that's which way you go. It doesn't have to necessarily be that, but you do have to be flexible in adjusting and adapting in the, in the things that you can adjust and adapt with. I love it. That's such a great insightful answer to wrap it up. And uh, definitely one of the biggest challenges I think for everyone is that there's more people involved at, at all levels of sport. And now you have to, as you said, be able to handle the responsibility of, of educating them. So just a great thing. Jamie, I cannot, th cannot thank you enough. Coaches, I can't encourage you enough to follow Jamie everywhere he is. He has a ton of great content and a ton of sharing throughout all of his social media as well and his podcast as well. So Jamie, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it, Chris. Keep up the good work you're doing. A great podcast. You have great guests on. I, I was honored to be part of that.